actually before I start, um, how many of you have got binoculars or a telescope? Okay, quite a few of you, that's good. Okay, um, essentially this talk is really based for basic, as in beginners. So um, the committee thought that we've got so many new members that have come on board that it seems a shame that we we could miss them by not offering something else rather than our normal monthly talk, which some people might find a bit intimidating. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it does for me as well. Yeah. So essentially what this is, is just to give you a bit of a taster and an introduction into, you know, the wonderful world of astronomy, basically. Um, so I hope you, you can find it, so take something away from tonight. Um, what I'm going to do is, this, this is in two parts. Basically, the, we've got the, the, the boring bit at the beginning, <laughs> and then we've got the second bit, which is about the telescopes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor up, and then I've got there's Martin, Steve, Gary, and Robin at the back there, and a few other people who I know, I'm looking at you, Phil, um, that can help out. If you've got any questions, please don't you know, hesitate to ask them. That's what we're here for. Um, I think that's about it, you know, in case we've got any more stragglers coming in. That's it? Okay, right. Here we go then. Okay, so, um, Steve lovingly corrected me. I love the stars to fondly be, to be too fearful of the night. I put it down as Galileo, but it's not. It's Sarah Williams, and it's part of a poem. And I'm glad that you told me, because uh, I think some people in here that are into literacy probably uh, tell me otherwise. So um, let's get started. What is astronomy? Bit of a basic question. We all think, well, what is astronomy? Is it looking up at the night sky? Well, it's a science that, de that deals with the materials of the universe scientific study of the universe, planets, galaxies, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much up there. Solar, well, our nearest star, which is the sun. Um, also, there's so many branches of astronomy that you can go to. So why do stargazing? It's a science, basically, that you can contribute to in such a vast way. Um, there's a... You can do it alone or collaboratively. So um, if you feel you want to bud, buddy up with somebody or, or a group like us, you can go out. You can um, just look at the night sky, do the imaging that a lot of us do, or just the observation as well, which is a thoroughly enjoyable thing. For me, it's a great stress buster. Um, if I've had a hard day at work, come outside, just look at the stars. And it's just, I hate to use the word mindfulness but it is it really does play a good part in de-stressing so basics we're going to go learn about observing the night sky learning the patterns of the constellations identifying planets finding the pole star which i'm not sure who said can i find it oh well, that's you isn't it phil who knows already um observation of our moon learning names of stars and star hopping which is quite a good way of learning constellations and asterisms, stars, planets, etc. So uh, what you'll need, you'll need definitely warm clothes, especially now approaching into the winter months. You'll need a compass, uh, a planisphere, which is one of these, but I will tell you a bit more of that later. If anybody wants to come up, I'll show you how to, to use it. It's a really useful bit of kit, especially it's, it's very low tech, but, uh, you know, very useful. You'll need a red headlight, which I've got in here. Um, and essentially, it's basically for night vision, which I will actually explain to you later sorry about that so red lights yeah um a journal really important a journal you can sketch you can 
uh, write down your observations. You can say what time it was, what night, what part of the sky, what constellation it was. And you can always refer back to these journals. And as I said, if something you observe, maybe you might, might see a, you know, sort of a, a supernova or something like that. And then you can go back and you can put, compare and contrast. Um, oh, too quick. So, and then a suitable star map on an app. In this day that, and age that we live in, everybody's got an iPhone or a, an Android phone. Um, they are probably an essential part now of astronomy and they're easy to use, uh, but I'll go through that in a minute. And also a suitable location. So warm clothes, boots for sure. Okay, you'll stood out in minus five for goodness knows how many hours. And I'll tell you what, it gets cold, but you can you can basically counteract that by, you can buy proper socks, um, you can buy gloves, which are thermal ones. Thermal underwear, a must, absolute must. Um, for me, if I didn't have them on there, I wouldn't last five minutes. So it's worth, it's worth investing in. They are expensive, but some of them are, well worth doing like long johns and tops as well hat a scarf or a snood so the snood is quite good because you can actually wear it around your neck so all the heat actually is captured up to here and that's also you can pull it over the top of your head and wear a beanie hat um and hand warmers which i've got which are these they're essentially all they are i've got they're 99p you can get them from i think it's uh yeah halfords anywhere like that you break it and you can just slip them inside your gloves and they'll they, they, they keep your hands nice and warm because the last thing you want is really numb fingers especially when you're all trying to focus and things like that right okay so there's the planosphere that i said that i was going to tell you about um essentially with a planosphere what it is um if i can find it it's a disc. Uh, all it is is a disc. Like that. You've got round the outside. And as I said, you can't see it. I'll um, explain after the talk. You've got an arrow. And basically, you put in your time, your date, um, and uh, what time it is. And it will tell you exactly north, south, east, west, what constellations there are. Low tech, but really valuable. Um, compass for obvious reasons, because if you, you want to know where north is, you want to know where south is. So key uses for the star maps on mobile devices. As you can see, you've got uh, weather forecasts, uh, planning for widescreen um, photography like Milky Way shots. Um, ISS passes, a lot of people find a lot of pleasure in watching the, the ISS come across. Not the Elon Musk awful um, satellites, we can uh, forget about them. Um, identifying galaxies and nebulas. The good thing is, is also you can put them on red light so it doesn't disturb your, your night vision. Um, and also they have a camera so you can actually pan around and you can actually overlay. The camera will overlay what you're seeing, which is a very useful app. Um, and also it tells you about the actual objects themselves. So first one I'm going to talk about is Stellarium. OK, now Stellarium was probably one of the first, I think. Um, the only issue with Stellarium is the basic one is basic but there's in-app costs after that. Um, then you've got Sky Safari 7. There's six, five, I think. There's a, Which one is there now, Steve? Seven's the top one. Seven is the top five, one. Six. Yeah, I've got six as well. But I find that very, very useful. But that's a paid-for one. Um, photo pills. Now, um, there was a lady that, that does a lot of uh, Milky Way um, shots and Aurora. Um, if she wants to set up anywhere on a landscape, she can actually plan exactly where the Milky Way is going to be. She can actually put a camera during the daytime and she'll know exactly where it's going to be at any one time. So she can actually plan everything beforehand. That's a really useful thing. If you're going to go out observing, etc., 
then that's something that you should, you know, really plan ahead. Don't just turn up, plan ahead, you know, write what you want to see and then go for it and then see, see how it goes. Because if you just, if you just turn up at somewhere with no plan, you'll be hunting around the sky and before you know it, it's time to go home or you're getting cold. Um, right. Clear outside. That's a really good app. This, this one, uh, it can be a hit, hit and miss. And the committee and I, we were discussing that the BBC at the moment seems to be hitting the mark and they seem to be getting better at, of, um, at, at basically forecasting. But this one will t give you a location. It will, you can put in where you are, put your longitude, latitude. Um, and if you can see here, green isn't too bad that's this is a good good night sky you know so it's nice and clear we'll tell you how transparent this sky is too which is a a good thing to know right what is dark adaption okay so the dark adaption is incredibly important um what i'm going to talk about is rods and cones okay right so essentially You've got the optic nerve here and you've got the cones. Now, can you see they're colored there? And then you've got the rods there. Now, what happens with dark adaption, it takes a good half an hour for anybody to be able to, before you go out observing, you, you must be dark adapted because you won't see any of the objects that you're after, like galaxies, uh, nebula, that sort of thing. Um, what happens is there's a, a chemical called now i can't get this right rhodophosphin i think it's called is it the rhodophosphin it floods the the eye and the, and the body and it en enables people to be able to see much better in low light now with the cones what happens is the cones are good at reading say uh, if you're reading a book they're good at picking up colors etc etc um but it's something to bear in mind. It's a very important thing to do with, uh, if you want to see anything, basically you've got to be dark adapted. Right, suitable location. Um, as it says there, try and find somewhere with a really low horizon, a 360. Um, no light interference, which these days is pretty difficult, but we're lucky, we're blessed, we've got, um, we have a, a dark sky site not too far from us, Bramble Chaseway. Always worth it. Always worth going to. Um, also, 360 degrees, so you know where the North Star is. That's very important, Polaris. Um, and in the daytime, if you're going out somewhere, go and check it out. Make sure that where you're driving to is okay. There's no potholes where you're going to stumble into. And, you know, it, it's worth observing and if you go out with someone that's perfect but all of you know we've got a we've got a, a whatsapp group um if you're out on your own please especially and i hate to say this especially females if they're out on their own it's well worth just saying hey guys i'm at so and so i'm going to check in every now and again and it's you know and there's a lot of people on our whatsapp app that will keep a check on you that's that's very important um Oh, I've done that already. Okay, so this is essentially what we use for location. It's called what three words. Has anybody heard of what three words? Right, perfect. So our usual one is the Hyde Cricket Ground at Fording Bridge. And that is it, sending baseline perfectly. Now, what we're going to hopefully do is the second part of this talk will be the practical part. And we're hoping that we can actually set up on here because there's a good car park next to the school. Um, it's accessible and people will know where it is. But the only thing is, like Steve pointed out tonight, if it's if it's mo it's a moonless night, but if it's frosty and really heavy with frost, sometimes that hill can get a bit frosty, can't it? But we'll 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 probably let you know anyway. Yeah, you can usually get up if you go up towards Sutton. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. See, that's another thing we can do with the uh, WhatsApp observation thing. We can we can alert people. You know, we say, "Oh, don't come up that road. Come up the other way." 
Um, Abbotswell Road, that's another at Falling Bridge. That's that's a fairly good place that you can go to. There's two parts to the car park. I don't know if anybody's been up to Abbotswell. Um, it's it's a bit potholy, but it's worth going to. Um, next one is Turf Hill at Hale. Uh, purlieu a lot of people i think there's a one of our members uses it a lot but he comes from southampton to use it but turf hill can be a little bit let's say you know you get some idiots up there so just be careful if you're going to go up there make sure you've got somebody with you right star hopping okay Th this is really something that um astronomers use to be able to as it says step from one place to the next if you're after a particular thing that you want to observe or even image then it, it's a useful tool to be able to to do so also we use uh, a handy guide for measuring now um, essentially what it is astronomers use distances in degrees or arc degrees okay so what you can do, as it describes on here, um, if you can see here, you've got Ursa Major or the bear or the shopping trolley, 25 degrees. Now, what that is, is all you've got to do is you've got to shut one eye at arm's length and you can see the actual degrees. Um, one degree is your finger. And as it says here, you've got 5, 10 and 15. So if somebody says, oh, it's... 15 degrees from say Sirius you, you know exactly where it is um, very useful tool so finding north okay so finding north so we've got we've got some pictures here of constellations with the stars behind them so as you can see you've got Ursa Major there you've got Draco you've got the little bear or Ursa Ma uh, Minor um, so if I go oh, and sig this down here, so if we go like that, we take the constellations away, but keep the stars and the actual diagram. Now, what when you'll see any star maps on books, you'll see this. Um, so here you've got Draco, you've got Ursa Minor, and weirdly enough, that is Ursa Major. That's the shopping trolley. But can you see how much bigger it is? It's, it, it, it looks like a bear on its back or on its feet, basically. Um, so how do we find north? OK, so when you look up, that's all you'll see. OK. They're the pointer stars. You've got Merrick and Doob. So that is the tail. And then you've got the shopping trolley and you've got these two. So what that will do, if you draw a straight line, and that will hit straight onto Polaris. Okay, so always look out for these two stars. If you're not quite sure where Polaris is, everybody, including me at the beginning of astronomy, I thought, oh, Polaris is going to be so bright, I can see it, but it's not. It's not bright at all. Um, but with this, it's a very useful tool to find north. And it's that distance. And it's that distance, as in 25. Yeah, 25 degrees. So you've got like that. You'll have, put your hand up from that star to there, 25 degrees. So you'll know where it is. Five times the distance between the points. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So constellations. Well, can we go, can we yeah, back? sure, of course, yeah. Um, particularly at this time of year, in the early evening, um, Great Bear can be quite low down. Mm. So it's um, so it's behind... It's almost yeah, down here, yeah. isn't it now, Steve? Yeah. 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 You've got Cassiopeia and Scovinger up here. At the big end of Cassiopeia, and it's the same distance. There you go. So if I can find so, it. There you go. Yeah. There. Okay. Which one is it, Steve? It's the, the, the big angle. The big the, angle the, the there. Top, the top one. To there, to there. No, no. Oh, there. Tom, that one there. So That's it. That That's the one. There. Yeah. This. Straight across. Yeah. So you can't see... Okay, so if you can't see now, yeah, go for that. And of course, it's always in the it's it will always be in the night sky somewhere because it's never never goes below the horizon. So constellations. So here we have a few 
stars? Who are they? What are they? You know, what what don't we know about them? I know them because I'm sort of, I, I love this. This for me is my favorite part of the sky. So you've got Orion here, the hunter. You've got um, Taurus up here. There's, there's some lovely objects coming up. So there you go. There's the constellations themselves. So you've got Orion. You've got the stars here. There's Be Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and there's Bellatrix, um, Rigel, and Safe. Um, there's so many things if you if you look at the stars and then you you can actually start seeing the actual constellations themselves now there's a constellation that i like called Auriga. and it doesn't care it doesn't matter what you call it i call it the daffodil because it looks like an upside down wilted daffodil but if it helps you in any way if you think oh that's that weird looking you know and you call it you've got a nickname for it then by all means use it so there we go. We've got Orion here. We've got Taurus at the top. I think that's Monosaurus there. Lepus. Ken, uh, Kenneth Major. Right. So we've got Orion. And here we call it. It's called the Armpit Star. I don't know if you call it. I've never called it that. But I think this is the um, the Islamic name for it. A lot of these stars are named by Islamic um astrologers back in uh i think it's about the 15th 14th century we had a lot of stars named after it but they get corrupted over time so we call it betelgeuse now if you can see that you've got Procyon here and sirius here so canis major canis minor so you can you see already you've got like um the start of a triangle this is called the winter triangle what's what happens there is because you know now you've got the winter triangle here once you start overlaying in your mind different um symmetries etc you can then move on to if they say oh within that there may be is it the rosette nebula in there steve i think there is so you might oh i think i'll have a look at the rosette nebula well you know it's going to be within that that's triangle so constellations again so here we go we've got another lot here what are they so we have cephas we've got cassiopeia who anybody here observe cassiopeia there's a big w in the sky yeah so i'm not talking to uh stupidly there so then you've got obviously uh ursa minor there so cassiopeia here's another one for you so we've got cygnus the swan up here and hercules and a bit of draco at the top i believe uh so now if we look at this is one of this this particular object now is just starting to you'll sit very early in the evening but it's just starting to go away now in, into the southern sky i think so you have cygnus here you've got lyra sagittaria uh, aquila and delphinius right if you go like that you've got deneb which is a bright star. You've got Vega, which is a very um, bright star, and Altair. Um, I think that's Aquila in Altair. Um, so if you do that, you've got the Summer Triangle. <coughs> now, the Summer Triangle uh, is a very useful um, place to be. There's an awful, awful lot of objects in this area here. Um, if I go back again, I think that's Alberio just around here, isn't it, Steve? The Alberio is a beautiful, beautiful double star. Um, if you get a chance to see it, one of the first things we do as astronomers, if nobody knows what to look at, is to look at that because the contrast in colour of the stars are amazing. You've got a beautiful red-orange um, yeah. sun and beside it is a beautiful blue one. Summer Triangle. Okay, this one. Again, you've got Sagan in Cassiopeia, 
and you've got the top of Perseus. So it goes into there. But my first wow moment, we call it a wow moment, when somebody looks at Saturn or they look at uh, Jupiter. But my first one was the double cluster. Now, if you look between that star there on the Cassiopeia and the top of, it looks like a triangle in Perseus, about middle, midway to the right, you've got a double cluster. You can't miss it. They are, it, it looks like little clouds, but they are stars and they're beautiful. A really good object to look at. Okay, talking of stars, um, we've got, the main spectral type of stars, um, O obviously being blue, which is extremely hot, and then we've got M, which is not, you know, it's on a, on a scale of um, heat, Kelvin temperature. The way I remember this is basically you've got these classes, so you've got the O class, B, and all the way, and a, a good way of remembering it, which obviously I can't because I've got it written down, is oh be a fine girl guy kissed me and it's always worth repeating that and then you'll know only boys accepting feminism get this meaning <laughs> ah there you go <laughs> i should have remembered that one so there's the spectra um obviously the o the the the, the temperature is me measured in kelvin which is extremely hot on the o and then uh, i won't bore you too much with the science of it but you get down to here. Our star, however, our nearest star, is a G-class, which is this one. Um, it's a kind of a Goldilocks star. It's just right. It's, you know, it's about 4.8 billion years, is it, Steve, old? Yeah, something like that, um, which is probably about halfway through its lifespan. So I think we're okay for a while anyway. Right, star magnitude. An important thing to relate to, because when you look at a star, I automatically thought the brighter it was, the more numbers there were. So say Vega, which is a very bright star, I thought that's got to be a four, that's got to be a five, but it's not, it's the other way around. It's actually a naught. So the brighter the star, the lower the number, and then it goes into minus, but the, the fainter the star, the more numbers there are. So if you look at, um, say, where are we? Th this just gives you an idea of what's, what's viewable. So Alberio that we were talking about, that's a three. Um, so just bear in mind when it's a three or a four or five, it's um, not a very bright star. But if you keep going down to, say, Vega and Sirius, they are into the minus numbers. <laughs> A Bayer designation, what that is, essentially, when you see any constellation map, you'll see on there, in lowercase, the Greek alphabet. Now, that's really useful for astronomers because they can designate the brightness or the a, a name. If there's so many stars within that constellation, they can call it after the actual alphabet. Like, we have the Orion Nebula. So you've got, which I'll show you in a minute. So um, you've got, that's the lowercase. And as I said, you can refer back to this because it's re being recorded. So you've got alpha, beta, gamma, delta, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in general, stars, as I say, they give a sign the Greek letter in, in the descending order of brightness. But there are exceptions, one of them being this guy. So you've got Betelgeuse, which is... Uh, Alpha Orionis, and you have Rigel at the bottom here, but that's Beta. So really, you'd think well, that star there isn't as bright as that one, but in this particular instance, Rigel is brighter. Bit confusing. It doesn't happen that often, but there's a few. But in general, that's that's the the way that the astronomers be a, you know able to see what brightness the stars are. Right, let's go into planets, solar system planets. Okay, so forgive my diagram. The size in relative to each other is definitely right. The distance definitely isn't, okay? Because we are definitely not right next to Mars. We're definitely not next to the sun that close. But that just gives you our neighbours in the solar system. So... I'm going to talk a little bit about the elliptic and why that's important to 
being able to find these planets. So here we have the elliptic through the night sky. And essentially what that is, that's the path of the sun. We follow the elliptic as well. So what you have here is going through all the, the um, constellations that you've got. And it's in a sort of an arc. But why it's useful to astronomers is because we know it's on the elliptic, we know exactly where they're going to be at any one time. And we can tell, you know, we can say, right, we want to observe Mars. We know where it is in the night sky because they always follow the elliptic, which is a path that the sun follows. Um, it's, the, it's on an, what they call an orbital plane. So if you can imagine, it's like a massive disk, which is this one. So it's not, it's not a complete science. There are exceptions to the rule, but in general, the orbital plane, they're all on a, on a plane that we can follow. In fact, our own, when you observe the sun, you'll see it in an arc. It's not actually moving in an arc. We're the ones that are doing that. We're following the elliptic. The Earth is doing the elliptic. So how does it help us? As I said, you know, think of it, we can, you can track the sun around because it doesn't actually move. It's the Earth that does. So we know exactly at any one time where the planets are. So here we have a picture of our, the beautiful Saturn, another wow moment for a lot of people. And then Jupiter. I think that's an actual picture. I'm not sure that's a photograph, but it could well be. And our nearest and dearest celestial neighbour, the moon. A bit underrated a lot, uh, by a lot of people. Um, if you're starting out in astronomy, it's probably one of the first things I would recommend you see, especially with binoculars, because it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, I'll tell you for why. Um, <laughs> full moon, not so beautiful, because none of the details there, it's all washed out. But if you go to there, this is the perfect time to have a look at it. That line through there where the light and the dark, it's called the terminus. And on the terminus, the light is, is it's cast, if you, if you can see it, into the craters. And visually, it's spectacular. You can see, so you can see what they call rills. You can see mountains, the, the shadows of the mountains as the sun goes through. And obviously, that changes through the months. Oh, sorry, through the days. So here we have the phases. You've got the new moon, waxing, any of these, perfect. Oh, come on in, come on in. Oh, yeah. All right, Denise, go on in. Oh, gosh. That's all right. Um, so, yeah, we've got uh, all the different phases of the moon. But don't underestimate the moon. It's a, it's a great object to watch. Right, galaxies, what are they? Well, essentially, um, dust, um, a lot of uh, hydrogen alpha, um, oxygen, sulfur, and dark matter as well. This is essentially what holds them all together, so we're told. It's, it's changing all the time, but it's all, it's all um, it, it's very uh, subjective. That's definitely not, that's not the Milky Way at all. I'm not sure which galaxy that is. Um, here we go, Andromeda, right. Our most famous galaxy, two and a half million light years away. Now, this one, is the furthest naked ice object that we can see as humans. It's two and a half million light years away. And it's a fantastic object to, to show beginners, which we, we're hoping to, because I think it will be around, wouldn't it, for a while? Yeah. Great object to look at. Um, it's a very beautiful thing. That's the Whirlpool Galaxy. Not such a, you, you won't be able to see that. You'll be able to see that through a, um, bino um, probably a powerful binoculars and telescope. That's the sombrero and the needle galaxy. Now, nebula, okay, now what are they? Nebula are regions of the sky where um, planets and suns, especially suns are formed. Um, it's where we've got, you know, uh, dust, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, sulfur, they all come together and creates uh, baby suns basically going back to uh, orion 
there's a which I'll show you in a minute. If you can uh, just hang on to that, there it is. Now these three here is called the trapezium here. Those three stars there, I think from memory, I think they're about three million years old, which is really really young in relative terms to what you know what's going on up there, especially with some of the stars that are about four and a half billion. So this one. This is called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, named after Zeus's daughters. This is what they call a reflection um, nebula. Now, with a reflection nebula, it's like somebody shining a torch behind a cloud. Um, it's actually pushing through, almost like mist. Beautiful object to look at. That one is a globular, what they call a globular cluster. Now, they're some of the oldest objects in the universe. I believe there's one in the Hercules that um, constellation, and I think they're about 12 billion years old. Is that right, Steve? 12 to 13. They are very old. Um, they actually live on the outside limb of our um, galaxy. We've actually there's actually been studies now where they found globular clusters in other galaxies as well. So it's it's not unique to ours. Okay, expectation versus reality. Um, this is a this is a big thing, um, especially for youngsters. When you look through a telescope or binoculars, don't expect to be seeing these fantastic pictures that I've just been showing you because you won't. You'll see this essentially. Um, th this I think is the Ryan Nebula, but it's just. Well, you, you, you've got to temper your expectations. It's not gonna, you're not going to be looking through and you'll think, oh, where's the Hubble picture, you know? Um, all I can see is a fuzzy blob, okay? But with fuzzy blobs, you get a lot of enjoyment out of them. Um, you can train your eye to see an object. Um, there's two objects. One's called uh, the Bose Nebula, or Bose Galaxy, and the other one's the Cigar Nebula. Now, they're very close to each other. Steve taught me this one. You look at one, and you, you look at it, you can't see it, but the other one pops into view, and it's very bright. But then you look over to the other one, and, the other, and that one disappears, but the other one pops into view. This is called averted vision. Okay. Now, averted vision is quite an important thing, especially when you're doing um, binocular or telescope observation. Um, You'll be amazed how well it works. What, what you could do, as I said with the journal, if you see a particular um, object and you like the look of it, try sketching it. I, mean, I know it's hard with red light, et cetera, but sometimes um, you can put, put it around your neck and you've got the thing, sketch it, and, you, and then you'll start to th see the thing come into view. Keep going back to it and have a look, look up again. Um, I'm going to talk about rods and cones again, unfortunately. Right, okay, so with the rods... They're not very good at picking up colour, but they are very good at picking up light, whereas the cones are good at colour, but not very good at light. And this is why when we look away from either left or right of the object, they'll actually come into view. So say you've got, say you'll look at, there's the object. If you look here, it will come up into uh, vision. If you look there, it'll come up. But I think if you're left eye, you can do the same. Um, it's, quite a, it's quite a useful tool. Right, so um, I'm going to just put on another little slide and then I'll be with you. Hang on. Uh, okay. Right. A little bit about telescopes. Now, I, I'm going to admit now I don't know a lot about binoculars. There's people here that do, especially Steve. And if there's any you want to know about it, he's the guy or anybody else here. So um, the anatomy of a, a setup. So you've got the optical tube, you've got the finder scope, the eyepiece, the star diagonal, the mount, the tripod. Um, so each one of those is really important to the other. Um, I've always been told that if you, you know, when you're starting out with, you know, observational imaging, 
try and get the most ex the, the most one you can afford would be the mount and the tripod if you've got a stable tripod and you've got a good mount then everything else will follow eyepieces you've got two sets you've got what, what they call a 1.25 inch um they are kind of standard or you've got the two inch which is another um, measurement that they use why they're not in centimeters or millimeters i've no idea i think it's just a traditional then you've got an eyepiece adapter which you can put onto the viewfinder you have a single speed focuser and a dual speed focuser um that one sometimes they're in plastic just avoid them they're horrible in my opinion uh now i've got i've actually bought one with me so people can have a look at it now when you're observing the last thing you want to do if i go back to this one can you see the angle of it <laughs> so what you're doing you're looking like that and it's easy to look down Otherwise, you'll be looking up through that way, and also it will be out of focus. So you need one of those, which you're more than welcome to come and have a look. I've got some eyepieces in there as well. So after the talk, we can have a little chat and you know go around. Um, yeah, that's that. Right, uh, finder scopes, quite a, a useful tool. Um, you can. Essentially, there's like a little red dot. I've got one here to show you, but a little red dot there. Uh, during the daytime, especially with a finder scope, if you can find, say, an aerial or a, uh, a chimney, and what you do is you focus in on the chimney or the aerial, but you also focus that as well. As in, I say focus, but there's these little knobs up here, and that you'll be able to adjust it so that they line up with the telescope. So that's really important. So that gives a wider view of what you're looking at. So you can actually see where you're going in the sky. Um, I won't go too much into it, but we've got different mounts. We've got an alt as mount, mounts, which if you can imagine, it does a, a zigzag like that. But the equatorial mount, or they call it German equatorial, um, if you can imagine with the night sky, it does an arc and that follows the arc and it will actually it's called right ascension um there's two two um things they've got declination and right ascension and the dobsonian mount which is this one here which is it's an all as but it's what they call a light bucket and it's a very good thing to look at the planets and the and nebula and galaxies um quote best telescope for beginners are the the ones that are easy to set up after the talk steve's going to show you this one over here especially for young young people aspiring people it's so easy um you know when it's raining or the the, the clouds clear away you go you can go out so this is my personal uh, pick um i've lifted this basically from the sky at night magazine so we've got this one here, the Star Sense Explorer, quite a, se a simple one. Um, I've actually given you the, the up to date price on these, but this is from a company called Alte Astro. We've got on Discord, we have a, um, a, a supplier review. I really, really um, beseech you almost have a look at it, have a look at the Discord. If, you, if it puts you off a little bit, if, if anything, have a look at the supplier reviews because. That gives you an idea of how good they are. Um, the Star Sense Explorer has got a, essentially it's got a dock. There's, there's another one I'm going to show you in a minute, but you can put your phone in there um, and it's got a little mirror. And what you do is you download an app and it's what they call push to. Now with push to, what that does is if you, with your little finder scope, say you, you want to go, say you want to go to Alberio, which I said, the, the double star. You can actually put it in there and it's got little arrows that will point you to the actual object. So what you do is you physically swing your scope over and it'll it'll tell you exactly where you're, you know, where you are on the on the actual object itself. It's quite a good app, especially for beginners. Okay, so this one, 
this is a basic, uh, what they call a go-to scope. Um, you put it on the tabletop, press a button, knows where it is in the in the in longitude, latitude, etc., and away you go. Um, so you've got a hand, either a hand controller with it, or or there's an app. And with the app, you can just tap in what you want, and it will go to it. But expensive, but not not um, too bad. Tabletop telescopes, they are very very good to use. I mean, like this one here. This this isn't uh, what they call a go-to. It's one that you can actually point to, as it were. Now again, Star Sense Explorer. That's the one thirty. The, the, when it says the 130, that's the aperture. So it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, 70s are okay. 80s are brilliant. Um, there's different types. There's a, what they call a, a, a reflection, sorry, a reflector, which has got a mirror on the bottom of the, the scope and the viewfinder's at the top. And basically the image comes in through the top, bounces back, and then there's a secondary mirror and it goes into the eyepiece. You've got another one called a refractor, and that is our, you know, the good old fashioned ones, which we, I think there's one in the corner, that's a refractor. Uh, and then you've got um, uh, what they call a Cassegrain or a Matsuva, which is a series of mirrors that bounce backwards and forwards and it enables the tube to be shortened. Um, I'm sure there's another one that I've missed. Yeah, that's it, the one at the back there. That's the Matsuva. So again, just to go back to the Star Sense Explorer, you download the app. I don't think it's free at the moment, but when you purchase the actual scope itself, they let you download it, and away you go. It's, I, I've used it. I've got a, I've got a friend in France who who had um, a scope, a little reflector. He said just can't get the thing to work, and I said, well, why is that? Well, what he did is just plonked it like that. Didn't do anything else with it. But what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to balance it, point it north, and you know do all the basic things you can to help it. Right, start this. This one is a new what they call a Newtonian. As I said, you know you like the reflector. You've got the mirror in the bottom. The light comes in at the top, bounces off the mirror here, and there's a secondary here. Um, I made a massive mistake. I got one of the, I got the 150. Um, but unfortunately, by the time I put it on my tripod, I needed step ladders to get up to the top. So I, I, I kind of put that aside. Um, that's the Star Quest. Great for beginners. You can you can assemble it quite quickly. Um, that's the Heritage tabletop. Now I think that one's a, a hundred. Which one's that, Steve? That's the that's the one thirty. So that one there is slightly bigger. But that that. We're going to give you a demo on in a minute. Um, it's compact, lightweight, clouds clear. You can just put it out on your, your table and away you go. It's it's really, really convenient. Great for uh, you know for first time astronomers. When you now this is you're starting to get into the serious stuff now. This is fantastic for planets because we, we call them light buckets. And what happens is they they just bring in what they call the photons, and you can see so much more with these than you could do um, with maybe a refractor. Um, although some of the refractors, when you want to get up to 150, which is probably about the same as this, a refractor is so, so heavy. You, you can hardly pick it up. They're that heavy. Um, I know that looks cumbersome, but funny enough, they're not too bad. And they look, they look you can't put them on your mantelpiece, though. They are big. Uh, tube fits back on the hatch back seat. You can just dismantle it, put it back. Um, superb value for money. Um, next one. This is a serious one. Um, it's a 200p. I believe they go up to 300. There's a member of ours called Neil Mitchell. Uh, I don't know if you've um, seen some of his Jupiter and Saturn um, images that he put up recently. He does it with a 300, and they are incredible. Serious telescope, easy to set up, two bits on the back, same height as a 150p, but heavier. And it will show more of the uh, telescope than, you know, than the other group. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it for beginners, but you never know. You might want to get straight into that one. That's the end of my talk.
there you go your adventure in astronomy starts now we i'm going to open the floor to you we've got steve martin uh robin phil if you want to help out gary um please ask us anything you like we've got some kit here so christmas is coming up you never know i'm sure you'll be wanting to know uh how much and can i afford it etc but there you go i hope you enjoyed it okay Oh, uh, before I forget, there's some uh, leaflets here. You're more than welcome to take them on. I'm afraid there's only five of them, but it's just essentially what um, the difference is between reflector, um, you know, a, a refractor, etc. It's quite quite useful to know, but they're just up there. Just have a look. Okay.